Welcome to Between the Covers, the show for readers and writers and lovers of books. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> I'm delighted tonight to be joined by authors Kieran Larkin and William John Rostron. Uh, my name is Stephanie Larkin. I'm an author, a publisher, and the head penguin of Red Penguin Books. We're a publishing company for authors of all types and genres. So if you have a book inside you that has been fighting to get out or maybe a drawer full of papers, you have no idea how many people come up with like hundreds of pieces of loose leaf to us. But just go to redpenguinbooks.com and unleash your inner author. So please welcome our guests. Thanks for joining us, Bill and Kieran. Thanks for being here. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thanks for being on the red couch. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're the show for writers and readers. So um, do you like to read? Yes, quite a bit. Yeah, because um, you know, if you're supposed to write, you're supposed to read. I think that's the prime ingredient in being a writer is is to be a reader I'm glad first. You said that. Say that. Say that again, because not the all of the prime ingredient say in that. being a writer is to be a reader. Thank you. Because the years of experience of reading different opens up different directions that your stories can go in, and you can see which ways it you like the way it went and things you didn't like the way it went. Gives you ideas for ways to uh, produce your own work. So you like to read? Do you like to read, Kieran? I, th I think I like to read, yes, absolutely. What are you reading right now? Anything fun? Uh, right now I am reading a book about a female prophet from the Old Testament. That's and a page turner. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Especially um, considering the, the point of view taken by the author. Oh, okay. So, um, who apparently is, is looking at the Old Testament and looking at anagrams and special codes and unearthing, I think, heretofore undiscovered information. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. So it's the Bible and it's mystery at the same time, I think. Well, that's a research book, I'm yeah. guessing. Yes. Um, you reading anything for fun right now or no time for fun because you're researching? Well, that doesn't necessarily move away from fun. That can be fun, too. Um, it, it's, it's fun in its own way. But otherwise, I, I really like reading political thrillers and stuff. All right. So. And how about you? I like reading political thrillers, <laughs> but I, I th you, you ask for books that stick out in your mind. Yep. And the ones that always stick out in my mind are, yes, um, <laughs> this is a little known book. Um, and the way, to, the best way to describe it, it's, it's a what if, what if something happened different in history? Um, and I enjoy books like that. This particular one is about if Vikings had landed in the southern part of America and been stranded there. How would they have affected the Native Americans? How would the Native Americans affected them? Another one I just finished, this is called Children of the First Man. It fo this follows a thousand years of how they progress as they, wow. as they are affected by each. And the author actually used real places that are found in the United States that nobody knows how they got there, for example, is giant hills in the middle of Illinois, Cahokia. Right. And they don't know why the Native Americans built these giant hills. Well, he he, explains he has a fictional way gotcha. of what they were. Um, another book that I'm reading that uh, is the Clash of, Clash of Eagles, which supposes that the um, Roman Empire never fell. And because the Roman Empire never fell, they're the ones who discover America, oh. which leads to a conflict between the now uh, second millennium Romans uh, interacting with the Native Americans. So you've read about the Romans discovering America. You've read about the Vikings being the ones who were spearheading the Americans. Um, and we've actually had, I guess, the, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the British. Which, which is the best reality? Which would have turned out the best? Oh. <laughs> Are uh, these the best reality or not really? Well, the book that you have in your hand actually follows from beginning to end and doesn't suppose that anything changes. It just says that this is, like in other words, they, they progress and gradually they become natives. And uh, what, what made me actually like it is we, my wife and I tour the country in our, in our uh, RV and we went to a place in North Dakota called a Mandan village where Lewis and Clark actually stopped there and they they left and in their writings they said they came upon a tribe that had blonde Indians and wow. they couldn't explain it. 
Wow. By the time they went to the West Coast and came back, all of the native had died from the smallpox that Lewis and Clark had given them. Right, right. But there was someone who was on the trip with them who had painted a painting of it. And, and they said, and some of the language sounded vaguely like European. And so that interests me. So we would stop at places like that. Right, and right. so he would work that into the story, saying, well, this is what happened, right, as right. opposed to what could have happened, we don't right, know. Right. Oh, I, love that. Um, I, I find that it influences my writing. Because oh. what, when I sat down with my book, I said, one time I said, well, how come I don't write what I read? because my book is different than a lot of things I read. Right. And then I realized, well, what I actually did in my book is I said, what if my life had gone differently? Mm. And there's a certain event in my life, which I don't want to be a spoiler because it happens in the middle of the book. But I said, what happens if after that point, this happened? And then it becomes a little fictional. So right. it's a what if a of what myself. If. I love that. I love that. Well, we're going to have a short commercial break but before that if you've got books at home that you've already read and passed around to your friends and already loved and you don't know what to do with them please visit the bookfairies.org the book fairies collect over 50,000 books every month of all types they can be children's books adult books cookbooks test preparation books whatever you might have they distribute them to school districts and adults and kids in need right here on Long Island, as well as to over 50 libraries overseas in Africa. So visit thebookfairies.org, or you can drop off your books here anytime we're filming. I'll even give you a glass of wine if you stop by at the show. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to be back with our guest author filming live from Dallas, Texas. We'll be right back. <laughs> Writing a book is the adventure of a lifetime. Red Penguin Books take pride in giving our authors a publishing experience that is stress-free and celebratory all the way. Some of our authors first approach us with no more than an idea for a book that's ready to sprout. Others submit completed manuscripts. Whether you're at either end or anywhere in between, our goal is to get you published. At Red Penguin Books, we offer options and opportunities that are unique in the world of publishing and all of them are designed to keep you, the author, we so deeply respect in the driver's seat, unlike other publishing houses. So, if you want to write a book and are looking for a publisher, we've got you covered. Red Penguin Books deal in publishing services, book development, and ghostwriting for digital, print, and audiobook. Call us at 516-448-4993 or visit our website www.redpenguinbooks.com Between the covers. Thanks for joining us. Uh, tonight we have a special guest live from Dallas, Texas. Please welcome LaToya Harris. Hi. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Oh, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I love all the things the authors have been saying so far. Such interesting. And we books. haven't even heard all the good stuff, but we're going to get to hear the good stuff from you too. <laughs> Well, first tell say, us, is it nice and warm there in Dallas, Texas? Because we're filming from New York. Actually, um, normally it is warm, but today it is like uh, in the maybe 60s. It's kind of cold out here, too. Ooh, 60 for Dallas is cold. I know it is, it is. But tomorrow it'll probably be 90, so we're not worried about it. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you came to join us. Um, we have a picture of your book here so that we can all see in your website. Bobby, do we have that slide? Thank you. Love your book cover. So empowering. Awesome. Thank you so much. I wasn't at first about to do the book cover, but my designer was like, you have to show your face. Oh, no. Um, I'm so glad your designer said yes. The camera. So, yeah, I'm glad that uh, we, did, we went with that decision. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about Cleve and what made you write it and how it's been going ever since. Oh, wow. Um, 
leave has been definitely a journey. It has been a roller coaster ride because, of course, with a memoir, nonfiction is something I'm not normally used to doing. Who really? Wants to tell all about their lives and about the real world. Normally, we're so like behind the camera, really, you know, thinking that social media, you know, is how we're able to connect. So um, I come from a theater world. Um, I write screenplays. I wrote uh, Black Betty, you know, fiction. Um, I want something else. Um, I, I produce that. Okay, you're going to need to send me some of that because um, I didn't get some of those I've things. I've done also like Cream. Um, I've done almost like five stage plays that I produce. So this is my first nonfiction memoir. Um, I actually was inspired by um, the Holy Spirit. Um, I went through a very hard time in marriage. That five to seven year mark, you know, the seven year itch. Oh, the seven year itch, yep. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was tough. And I just realized how um, the world and, you know, TV gives you that idea of what marriage is supposed to be, that fairy tale where, where you meet someone and then uh, happily ever after. And then I realized that it takes work. Um, there's a interesting quote that says that um, anything that you have to labor over will give you profit. And I realized that that's exactly what marriage is about. That there will be a labor that's involved in it. There's a actually. Let me let me ask a question. Um, has anyone gone through conflict resolution training? Has their parents ever taught them? Oh, I mean, conflict I'm resolution my training. Say, no, no. My did, parents did you go did through conflict resolution training? Training. And I think that that's a big part of the book, just um, making people understand that I'm a marriage advocate. And in order to have a success rate um, with marriage, uh, you have to go into learning different things that you may not have learned before. Actually, an interesting <coughs> statistic is that 30 percent of our marriages will have a success rate if we do the extra coaching, the extra counseling, the extra therapy that is required for us to learn more about conflict resolution and more about just. Um, how when marriages hit a rough spot that it's normal, that it's actually called the stormy phase. And I use a bunch of my project management um, skills, uh, and I brought them back to marriage so that people will realize it's a partnership. Yeah. It's a partnership. Wow. It's a team effort. And if you're doing things like silent treatment, if you're doing things like, you know, us normal behaviors where we're just uh, numbing our feelings, drinking a lot to numb our feelings and uh, avoid the conflict. Because we think like conflict is a bad thing, but normally conflict is an opportunity to either change a uh, bad behavior or enhance the good behavior. So that's pretty much what the book is about. It's all out being real. And I am so glad you that. said that. Well, yeah. Uh-huh. You know, they're saying now that 50% of all marriages are ending in divorce. And what you're saying is so true that we go into marriage without the tools for communication and conflict. You're going to have conflict. You have you're to have those have tools. It. It's just a part of being human. Uh, my experience is going to be different from your experience. And most of us say that, uh, you know, marriage is in and irreconcilable differences. But, I mean, we're all different. Who told us that lie that we're going to find a perfect person who's compatible and we're going to get along for the rest of our lives? That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. And it's almost like we're set up to think that everything's going to be a fairy tale ending. Um, I thought that. And then when I ran into these issues, when we, and actually at the very beginning of the book, I, and this is also a hard part because at, with a memoir, uh, you think that you have to tell your whole life, but really a memoir is writing a section of your life. And the section of my life that I chose to write about is that uh, you're going to hit a point, the seven-year itch, around the five to seven-year mark, where you're going to end uh, going to a uh, storming phase, which is natural development within a project within mm -hmm. a marriage project within a partnership right where you're going to need to be able to resolve those unresolved conflicts to be able to get into the norming stage and then to the performing stage and then to the maintenance stage but first you have to realize that the storming phase is normal yeah. and that there's going to be some unresolved conflict and in order to do that you have to realize that it's normal and that you have to not be afraid. So, so within important. the book, a framework that will help you get over that mark, that, um, that hump. Uh, guts is framework. D stands for 
go first. Most of us think like, oh, well, I'm going to be silent about it. But who has ever had a cut or a bad injury? Mm-hmm. Have you ever decided, okay, well, I'm not going to talk. I'm going to just wait for time to heal that wound. No. You go to the doctor. You ask someone to diagnose it. That's the same thing with coaching and counseling and therapy. The root of the matter. And spoiler alert, uh, most of the time the, the communication is the issue. And we need to learn how to communication and going to that person first and not waiting for uh, the wound to cause to have infection is the biggest step. That's G. You understand the part that you played. Take an accountability for whatever part you played in the situation, not attacking the person for what you think they should change first, but saying, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't have dropped that dish. Maybe I shouldn't have thrown that picture. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Let's talk about what I think. Uh, hurt me and being vulnerable. And I think that that's one of the big things that women need to learn that we learn to help, we learn to be strong, but also need to learn gentleness and learn the fact that uh, coming to a partner to start that conversation and get hot, mm-hmm. which is another thing, honest, open, and transparent, is the biggest thing that we need to learn. And that's another framework in here. And then, of course, T, uh, taking the time to pause, taking the time to break, and meditate on the idea necessarily going in hot and heavy and thinking like let's let's have an argument about this let's get to the bottom of things i'm right you're wrong it's the wrong goal the wrong goal the goal is understanding the hurt understanding where was the hurt that caused him to raise his voice where was the hurt that caused me to get upset then of you know resolving conflict with others would be taking the time to pray that's what we understanding that individuals their seasons of change. There's going to be winter, just like New York is experiencing cold. The same thing with the relationship. You're going to experience where things are dying. For me, um, I talk about in the book how my father died and how that affected my relationship and how that affected how we interacted with one another. Right. So you have to right. understand there's going to be seasons in a relationship. There's going to be winter. There's going to be spring. There's going to be fall. And Absolutely. I talk about the specific things within a relationship that will that you will have to evolve. Right. That you will have to grow together. You'll have to keep the communication open. How you're going to have to lead in conflict. How you're going to have to make sure that you uh, take away any of the things that are distracting you from getting back together and finding that connection. And most of the time, it's communication. And you have to learn the skills to be able to communicate, to be able to make sure that unity is always the goal. Fantastic. I love that. I love that. So empowering for relationships. And I love that you you said so much that this is normal. This is what you need to know and to expect. So when conflict comes, you don't automatically just throw in the towel and say, well, that's it. When you exactly. Realize it, exactly. I mean, and of course, one important thing that I must uh, also include is that there must be boundaries set. Yes. I think that most of the time with in Christian relationships, um, and this is just me being honest. We think that we're supposed to just run a, 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 a bad behavior. That's not what I'm saying at all. No. I'm saying that we need to have set healthy boundaries because that's a part of communication too. One of the frameworks that are in the book is um, WOMD. And guess what that stands for, for? That stands for Words of Mass Destruction. Now, there is a play on weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> words <laughs> can be used as weapons, too. Yep. Triggers, but me and my husband had to communicate to say those are words that are off limits that we will not use. Because guess what? Those trigger me, and those make me want to break a dish. Those make me make me want to use words that um, are fighting words. So Absolutely. So, establish those healthy boundaries where we discuss, okay, words of mass destruction, you know what? What, whenever you use the words dumb, mm-hmm. that, that's a word that's going to make me not hear you anymore or try to see, understand the hurt. I love Let's that. Let's not use that word. Let's not use words like stupid. Let's not use words like any of those words can right. cause a trigger. And we want to make sure that we understand that those are words of mass destruction for our relationship. Love whether that. All right. Whether that's a parent relationship, whether that's a work relationship. We need to establish those words of mass destruction. Otherwise, we're not going to even be able to have a conversation. You are so right. I automatically put the walls up and say, I am not able to hear anything you're saying. Fantastic. So actually, a 
awesome framework that we have in the book. Um, not only that, but we have just uh, review questions. Oh, nice. In order to be able to have a good relationship, you have to have first self-awareness, mm -hmm. other awareness, be able to adapt, and be able to make sure that we're keeping the maintenance alive where we're able to adjust. But we found that there's another word. Like just recently, me and my husband, we decided, you know what? A new word that we're adding to our list of setting boundaries is making sure that we never use the word um, like, um, I don't care. Gotcha. Um, for me, that is a trigger. If yep. you're saying something like, well, I don't care about that, that automatically puts a wall up that I makes me you. think, well, what I'm saying to you is not significant. You're right. So we've added that word to the words of mass destruction, and we hope that the viewers out there start to use um, boundaries and set boundaries with words that are triggers. Doesn't that automatically make you think to yourself, okay, well, what are the words for me? Right? Yep. I get that. You're absolutely right. Could you tell our viewers where we can find your book so we can all check out these uh, trigger words and, and get on with the whole program? Where can oh, we find course, your book? Of course. of course. So first thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that you find me on uh, Facebook. Okay. That's where we hold, hold lots of conversation. And me and my husband, we have a oh, wonderful talk every Wednesday. So make sure that you go to uh, at Cleave in Conflict. Okay. You can find me also on cleaveinconflict.com. Okay. And just make sure that you also go to Amazon. Um, my pen name is Guy Harris. Okay. My Guy Harris. And you know what? I'm going to make sure that I get that Facebook link. I know I have your, your website and your Amazon links on our, on our website. I'm going to get your Facebook yeah. link. And can you send me a friend <coughs> request or something so we make sure you connect to our viewers? Of course, I'll be happy to, Steph. Thank yes, you, thank you, and thank you so much for joining us. Let's oh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks to everyone on the couch. Y'all are awesome authors, and I encourage you. Thank being you. <laughs> thank you, and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. So thankful for being on the show, Steph. You're welcome. Take care. And we're going to take a commercial break, and we'll be right back. Okay, thanks so much. Are you interested in writing, but you're unsure how to get started? Or perhaps you're already an author, but want to hone your skills and receive supportive, yet constructive feedback. Welcome to WebWritersRetreat.com, developed to help once and future authors like you to gain from positive and supportive criticism of your submissions from other writers and our professional staff, push forward through personal timetables and writing exercise sessions. Sharpen your skills through group coaching and Q&A sessions with literary experts. Receive practical resources such as templates, downloads, links, online courses, and free ebooks. Benefit from book reviews and opportunities to join a beta team to enrich yourself as well as other authors. Save with special discounts for publishing services and online courses, social media, and email marketing, and a whole lot more. Visit webwritersretreat.com and turn your writing dreams into reality. Do you have a book, either in your head or on your desk, just waiting to get out to anxious readers? Hi, I'm Stephanie Larkin, author, book developer, and head penguin at Red Penguin Books. We're a publishing company specializing in books of all genres and publishing in all formats, including digital, audible, and print books. From business books to romance, memoirs to mysteries, our authors have complete control over their books from start to print. We'll help get your book to booksellers all around. Major booksellers such as Amazon, Apple, Kobo, Walmart, even libraries and bookstores around the world. We believe in our authors. So call or email today to get your free publisher's packet to get started. Just visit us at redpenguinbooks.com and get your book out there and into the hands of your readers. At Red Penguin Books, you call all the shots. So call us today and turn your dreams into a reality.
Remember that. Welcome back to Between the Covers. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, while we're at commercial, we were talking about traveling, which is uh, my second favorite thing next to reading and writing. But uh, please welcome our next author, William John Rostrum, who wrote Band of the Wind, Sound of Redemption, and there's a whole lot more after this, yes. isn't there? Yes, yes, there's a third book. There's a Make third a book. complete trilogy. And all sorts of short stories. Yes. And you just keep writing and writing and writing. I'm retired from my full-time job 15 years ago, and this is what I do, travel and write. Travel and write. Sounds, sounds like the ideal thing to do. Really? So, so tell me about this series. What inspired all of this? Uh, um, it, interestingly, I was been writing for the last 40 years nonfiction. Um, I, I actually started writing in two different directions. I would write fiction. When I was a teacher, I would find that some of the things that were um, being given to the kids were not interesting them. So I started writing my own little short stories anonymously. I never told them I was writing them. Really? And, and it was interesting because I'd give them a list of questions to answer and one of the questions would be is, what did you think the author was thinking here? And what, To this day, unless they're watching this, <laughs> but none of my students know. Now you know. And that's, and that, <laughs> and that's how I started writing fiction. Wow. I started writing nonfiction as uh, years ago, I was very involved in my school district and, and I started writing things to try and get people to support the budgets of school districts. And one time I wrote something that I was trying to be really serious to get people to vote and I started being sarcastic with myself. And it ended up being a satire of school budget votes. Gotcha. And I sent it to Newsday and they sent me a hundred dollar check and I said, hey, <gasps> there's something to this. Wow. Yeah. So I st for the next 40 years I wrote nonfiction okay. and then I retired and I started writing a little nonfiction here, a little of that. And then in 2010, I had some medical problems and I didn't travel for a period of time. And one of the things to recovery was I was walking a lot. So I would put, I would put my, my uh, songs in my ear and I'd walk and I'd say, that song reminds me of something because I'd always had this story going on in my head. And I would get home and I'd write like two or three pages. And they came from that song. I did this for years, so I had little notes wow. and little pieces. I sat down after three years, put them all together, and said, this is the story I always wanted to tell. And it's told from the point of view of a person who is um, looking back from 1990 to things that happened in 1967. It's very much wrapped up in the culture and music of the 1960s. And what each each little journal entry because it's told as right. a it, the book starts with um, this journal was found on a beach in 1990. I love that flashback. And, 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 it, and, and then reading the journal. The journal was found 23 years after the person's gone missing right. and it's 1500 miles away from where he went missing from. And he says, I'm going, um, all the member, it's, there's a quote of the song Summer of 69 where it says, uh, uh, Joey quit and and uh, quit and the other one got married. Got married, yes. Right, got married and I said in my group they didn't die, uh, they died. And I had never told the story of what happened to them. They all died. And that's the beginning of his journal and he's telling the story um, to get over his own demons of what happened in 1967. And it goes through his, as the title says at the top, yeah. it says his coming of age, the coming together and yes. a coming of tragedy. Um, and it and tells a story of how these people bonded, their loyalty to each other, their music that was going to get them out of a very rough situation, mm -hmm. and it didn't work. So interestingly, I had some people say, I wanted a happy ending. I know. I know. <laughs> I like books with happy endings. I was so glad when you walked in today and you had the second book. I said, I need the second book because you left me without a happy ending. <laughs> I'm, I'm not convinced I get it with the second book either. <laughs> well, you have to read it and find out. I guess I'll out. have to read it and find <laughs> out if I get yes. a happy ending. But yes. I certainly didn't get it with the first book. But interestingly, when I finished but it's him, real. When I put all these notes together, the book was 900 pages long. I said, it's not one book. This is three books. Yes. And it took... Oh, so you wrote the three... In my head, I put them all together, gotcha. put them on paper, having no idea how long it would be, right. and pressed word count, mm. and it was, was 247,000 <laughs> words. Oh and I said, I think my daughter was the first one who said, that no. can't be. No, no, no. <laughs> and I said, okay, so first Thank of all, I have to... <laughs> 
Thank you for being real. No, <laughs> so, no. So, first of all, she went through it and cut out about 60,000 words of Good fluff. Enough. If you need a job as an editor, <laughs> use somebody. And then I made it three books. Right. And um, it's funny, though, because some people that I had passed on the original long book really liked that little minutia, which is what, yes. there's still a lot of it in it, but some of it got cut, details of things that happened. Right. The people who lived through it, some of them really liked it. Right. You know, if you really... Well, what? you know, then your daughter was great eyes. And she didn't <laughs> live through it. She could be more discerning about it. So thank you very yes. much. Yes. You she are very lucky, by the way. That costs a lot of money, I'll tell you. That kind of good, <laughs> that kind of editing. I hope that you have reimbursed her in kind. <laughs> more. Criticize him was plenty. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> And but you did a good job. <laughs> you did a good job. And that's 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 the basis behind it was. But this story. Wow, I didn't realize they were all written at the same time. The first two were. The third was just a uh, an outline. Okay. But the first two actually at one time were one book. Wow. Yes, and. Uh, so no wonder you left me with one, and I was like, hey. And then you walked in today and said you want the well, second one. Well, like, I purposely didn't put out the second one for a while because the first one d can just end right there. I mean, it could, but. I was very happy to get this one today. <laughs> so let's all buy both books, folks. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm with that. Let's buy both books and the third, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, did you enjoy the process? And I love that you did worked with your daughter. Yes. I absolutely yes, loved yes. that she was part she's, of the process. She's my conscience. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> we all uh, need a conscience. But it, the conscience. Stor story had been twirling in my head for 40 years. It is based on real, real events. Um, a lot of the first part of the book were actual real life events. Um, and then the, in the middle, there is a life altering event that's true. Right. And in that point, I said, well, what would have happened? What would have happened to the other people? What happened, what happened to me if this happened differently? And then it becomes total a totally imagination none of it really happened and so on and uh, and that actually got to be more fun it, it was fun both ways because I was ca recapturing certain moments when I was talking about things that were real and then and then I said, wow, now I can just do anything I want. Right. No, I'm I love free that. now. I could do anything well, I want. in a sense, up until that point, you were almost writing, I'll say, creative nonfiction. Yes. And then once you hit that point, you were like, pop, pull the plug, do it, you know. Well, I, can, I can go fantasy now. Somebody told me that well, uh, you either have to make it a real memoir, and only famous people write memoirs, and, um, or you have to make it straight fiction. And I said, no, well, no, it's no. fiction written in the form of a memoir. Right. And I wouldn't give that up, even though I got criticized I by it. one no, person. No, no. Because you don't it, listen to the one person. That is what makes it, um, to me... Uh, in the, the titles and everything just right. but that was the hard part to edit because every time I edited it I cut out a title and a memory that brought up that title mm. but it worked well that's why you me. need to turn over your conscience because yes she yes didn't, she wasn't she just, didn't care about exactly, the title exactly she didn't care <laughs> and she wasn't you know we all fall in love with every single word on yes. the page and we are that's why we can't edit you know we can we're, why we right. can't self edit and why you need somebody that you won't kill afterwards when they cut all that Then I'd get angry because when it got shortened, I'd say, why didn't I think of saying it that way? That's okay. You said it. <laughs> right. You said it in 210,000 words? 247. 247,000 words. All built in little notes from my iPod with the song. and. I had no idea how long it was going to be, but it isn't now. <laughs> now it's two very short books. <laughs> Not short. Not short. that short. I mean, you know. Right. <laughs> they're good. Yeah, this one is 300 pages, everyone, right. you know. They're not short books, right. but, but they're doable. Now, you, you mentioned that some people liked the unedited version. So that means there were people who read the 247,000 oh, yeah. words? About 10 of them. You have very good friends. Yes. <laughs> yes, they were. <gasps> Wow. <laughs> My wife is going, yes, I did. You read In fact, she read it three times. <laughs> three times? Yes. 
Do you want a glass of wine? (laughs) 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 You deserve a glass of wine. Absolutely. And interestingly, she lived through some of it. Yes. So it was. uh, It it was uh, the 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 creative act brought back memories. You still like him and travel with him. Yes. (laughs) Married forty eight years. Forty eight years. That's why you knew about the book. That's why you're in the book. <laughs> right. But still, I did all this, and I didn't really feel it was ready. And then there's an organization called Visible Link. Um, and I submitted something to them. And they get about 400 submissions, and they put like 80 of them in a. And then they put about 12 of them on stage with actors. And I put a small section of the book. I made a, free, a, a self See, you told me like 800 words or something? Yes, it had to be under 800 words. How did somebody who usually writes 247,000 words get down to 800? Wasn't easy. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't easy. I mean, mean, my family will tell you, I don't do anything short. (laughs) Um, But I got it down to 800 words. Wow. And they accepted it as one of the 12 to put on. So exciting. And... um, the video is is available on my website and on right, YouTube, right. and it um, that gave me the confidence to go ahead and really push the Fantastic. books, because up until then, people who like you will say they like your writing even if they don't. And this was a whole but a whole organization of Actual people. Actual validation. Um, yeah, and so I did that, and so there's the video is called Pretty Flamingo. And uh, it was done, actually, interestingly. It, it's read and performed on stage at the Danny Kaye Theater in the city. And the actor who did it was Mr. Mistopheles in Cats. Oh. Uh, he told me after the fact. He goes, and, uh, and then the next year I submitted another one. Based on the characters in the book, I sort of twisted things that happened, but they were the same people doing slightly different things. Right, right. And that one was also put on the stage. Uh, and these videos are at your website. It's williamjohnrostron.com. Yep. Yes. We also name. have, I think there was a slide up that has your website. And we also have your website and book links and everything on our website. So we can push them out. Yes. Because there we go. There, there's, there it is. There's a picture yeah. of the first book and the link to the website where the videos of these. Yes. So if you want to see how we got from 247,000 words down to 800, the link is right <laughs> there. <laughs> so you can watch the video. Yes. That is fantastic. Well, we're going to break for a short commercial. I want an autograph because you're going places, man. You are absolutely going places, okay? We'll be right back after this. Between the covers, thanks so much for joining us. While I adore every single author that we have on Between the Covers, I must admit that I have a favorite. <laughs> and my favorite author was able to join us today, um, my husband, Kieran Larkin, um, who we had his book put launch party on the air a few months ago for Messengers of God. But I asked him back on because I know he's hard at work on, am I allowed to call it the sequel or part two? or? Let's call it a comp- book. A companion book. A companion book. So I would love for you to talk to us about the companion book. I think we do have a slide up. We didn't have a cover yet for the companion book, but there is a there is a, a, a title. You barely have a title. There's for the a companion. working title, and I would love for you to tell us a little bit about writing process. And Bill is quite the writer, and well. If you write too much, he knows how to get it down. <laughs> so, I see my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I figured this was a great forum for talking about writing process while we have someone who's in the well, throes of well, it. Well, I, I certainly may need, need to use you two as consultants. Yeah. <laughs> so well, tell us about the book and the companion. Well, I guess the story behind the book is, is, is really a simple one. Um, like you, Bill, I was a teacher. I'm a teacher. Still are. And um, I had the latitude as a high school teacher of being able to create one or two of my own courses. So I have uh, created a course on the Old Testament prophets. I'm a religion teacher. And um, I find that a lot of high school kids, while they know the names of the prophets, they know nothing about them. You know, they're just names. Because I think that on the grammar school level, even on the high school level, they just aren't explored depthfully. So I figured, okay, let's play around with that. So I uh, started teaching a course on the Old Testament prophets, and quite frankly, I found them as individuals to be incredibly heroic. Um, they, they all develop, for the most part, similar messages, but their individual lifestyles, the experiences they have, are all unique and special and one of a kind. And using some of my notes uh, and PowerPoint presentations, and then exploring and researching using other textbooks, I came up with my own textbook. And my principal was gracious enough to allow me to use it in my upcoming class as the textbook for my course. So I'm very excited about that. I've never used a textbook for this particular course, except the Bible. Never mind one that you wrote. That's right. So <laughs> now, the, now the kids can uh, See, now can Bill's going to want to go back and right. stop being retired so he could write his own textbook. Well, I will say this. Now, Bill, you have uh, written both, both fiction and nonfiction. I am dazzled, absolutely dazzled, by anyone who can write fiction, yeah. who can create an entire storyline filled with details and fictional characters. I don't have that level of creativity. <laughs> I find with something like this, I've got material out there already. It's really a question of taking material that already exists, compiling it, researching it, putting it together, molding it in a way that I like, that makes sense to me. But to move along to the second book. Oh, I love the story of why the second well, book. Well, here's the, here's the story. And um, now I teach in an all-girls Catholic high school. And uh, last year, as I was writing this book, I said to my students, I'm writing a book on the prophets. And when the book came out, I passed it around the class, and the girls took a look at it. And one of my students, who was a very, very bright young woman, raised her hand and she said, can I ask you a question? So I said, sure. She said, are there any women in the book? Ooh. And I said, that's an excellent question. And the answer, which you're probably not going to like, is no. I said, um, there are several women prophets mentioned in the Old Testament, but quite frankly, they are few and far between, and even the information about them is very scant. But then it got the wheels turning. And I said, you know, I teach in an all-girls school. I consider myself to be something of a feminist. I thoroughly enjoyed writing this book and researching it and so on. That would make for a really interesting and hopefully compelling companion book to flesh out a little bit more the women prophets of the Old Testament. So that's what I'm working on now. And it's not easy. You know, there is not a whole lot of information. And um, there aren't as many women who were listed as prophets. Now, I have to be honest and say, in my research, I can't help but think, and this is with all due respect to sacred scripture, <laughs> I think that women have been given short shrift in the Bible. I think that women probably have played a much more prominent role in Bible history, perhaps even in the composition of the Bible, than they're given credit for. And I'm hoping that my research will indicate that. And I mentioned earlier, I'm reading a book now written by a fellow who has apparently created some computer programs to linguistically analyze some of the writings of the Hebrew scriptures. Oh. And he's of the opinion that there are women, one in particular, um, who is absolutely central to the entire composition of the Old Testament, and yet is virtually ignored. And I'll be interested to see if other researchers will continue to verify the work that he has done, because it could take the entire, uh, our whole understanding of the Old Testament in a, new, in a new direction. Well, I mean, even besides the Bible, how many female authors 
in the 18th and 19th centuries had to use a male pen name That's right. or else they wouldn't be published. Even J.K. Rowling in writing the whole Harry Potter series she used deliberately JK. used J.K. Right. because she didn't right. want to advertise that she was a woman. So well, certainly it's if, nothing that's you changed. Know, 15 years ago, people were trying to blur the lines. You can only imagine 3,000 years ago how many women were actually attributed to other people in their lives and yep. such. Now, as far as uh, the writing of the second book is concerned, you know, um, I've been exploring websites, short stories, not short stories, short articles, I should say, scholarly articles, and other textbooks that focus on women in the Old Testament. And I'm pulling together a lot of information. So whatever I wind up compiling is really coming from a variety of different sources. And quite frankly, that's what I find interesting. I don't have the creativity to write a novel. Maybe someday I'll find it, but it doesn't exist right now. a little closer to Bill. Maybe he'll rub off. <laughs> Maybe that'll do it, sure. Here we go. <laughs> but rub, it, rub a little on the face. <laughs> yeah. do it. But, but um, I am enjoying the research. I'm enjoying reading what other people have written, trying to pull it all together, and, and maybe give it my own, let's call it stamp. Right. And, and that I find very fulfilling. I know from a, from a writing standpoint, I'll sit down and I'll say, okay, what do I want this book to accomplish? Once I figure out what that is, how do I want to organize the book? And once I figure out how I want to organize it, then it's really a question of going back and starting to sketch in the details where I can. Nice. You know, I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a methodology for me. Okay. Um, maybe other people have other methodologies, but that's, that's where I'm going with this. Right. Any, any tips? No, I'm just, I have questions now. Okay. My, no, Let's my go. question is would the next book then be the, the effect of women on the New Testament? Ooh. Um, that did they affect the Ooh, Gospels like being written? It's an excellent question. I love that. Book and I, and three. I have to, I'll give you <laughs> a, probably a substandard answer. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, the thing is, as a, as a religion teacher, I teach courses in the Old Testament. Right now, I'm not teaching a New Testament course. So, working in the Old Testament, um, is something that I'm working with right now in the classroom. Now, I certainly think that if all of a sudden my course of study changes and I wind up teaching a New Testament course, well, then now... I now asked the same thing in the car ride here. <laughs> so, you know, and may maybe I might kind of shift gears and move into the New Testament. I like that, and so, how women are affecting the New Testament. But, you know, but I do think um, that I think it's important that... And again, and this is... Uh, you know, coming from a teacher, a male teacher in an all-girls school, I think it's important that women are given historically, as well as at the present time, you know, all due credit for their accomplishments. And if my students see a book that is uh, uh, featuring the women of the Old Testament, the prophets of the Old Testament, and it is the same size and and weight, so to speak, of the of the male writers, I hope that it gives them something to to take pride in. Well, so that's your, your wife me. and the women in the audience and all of your female students. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have told Kieran that when I go out to um, book fairs and such that I am selling books as, as publisher and I bring along his book and people are buying the book and they're looking it over and they'll say, oh, is there another one? Oh, he's writing one right now on the women. Oh, I want the book about the women of the Old Testament. <laughs> so we already have pre-orders. So hey, you hold get that writing. thought. Yeah. <laughs> you better get writing because I have a lot of pre-orders for the next book. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. <laughs>
Welcome back to Between the Covers. <laughs> you have no idea, the, the viewing audience. You're missing all the fun here in the studio <laughs> tonight, that's for sure. Well, I know that besides people who love to read watching the show, we have lots and lots of prospective writers. Um, they say 90% of the population wants to write a book. So we have two writers sitting here on the couch, and we have some audience members who have been very involved in these books. Um, any tips for our future writers out there? Plug Sorry. away. Plug, Plug away. away. It's, okay. you know, it sounds it's, almost um, like a cliche, but do it. Do it, yes. Um, I, know, I know for um, most of my life, I would only write short things because I would say uh, three kids. Oh, and then he wrote 247,000 no. words. No, but I kept saying, when I have the time. And I mean, I put off the, the fictional right, right. novels that I ended up really enjoying. And I truly wonder when I was working, teaching in the public school and teaching in, in a public college, where I would have gotten the time to do it. And, and, um, but, you know, looking back at it, once I started doing it, I could, I could have found the time. Yeah. Now, I'm so glad you said that because, you know, we're, life is short. Write the book. Right. You know, and yes, we are monumentally busy, but when there is something that important, we do find the time. I also found that I found the time more often when I started enjoying it more. Right. Uh, when I was writing nonfiction and I was writing things for Newsday and other publications, I would, some issue would hit me and I'd get really, I'd really get emotional about it. And I'd sit down and I'd write it in one shot, edit it, give it to my wife to look at, my daughter to look at, friends at work, and I'd come up with the perfected copy. But it was. It was a process of two or three days. Right, right. And I kept saying to myself, I don't have the time to do that long term. And, and I really probably should have. Right, right. Um, so it, yeah, really, and when I started doing something that was this long, I've, I'm really enjoying it. Like I'm sitting down with the third book and I'm going, well, I could do this. But I really got a good idea. I'm oh, good. I love that. And, uh, and I sit down and I, and and I do, do it. it. Bill, did you find that just getting started was the, the, tough, the toughest oh, hurdle? Oh, the absolute hurdle. Really? I said it took a case of where I was literally could not do anything else yeah. for a period of about six months. Mm -hmm. And I, you're sitting around. There's only so much TV you can watch. There's only so many books you can read. read and right. then you say, well, I want to do something different. I said, well, I've been waiting to do this. And I would sit on the porch of our house, and I had the laptop out, and I and again I'd walk. Right. Up. Oh, here's here's two pages. Here's a journal entry into right, right. The, the main the character, Johnny right. Sith. The journal, journal of Johnny entries. Sith. Yes. So here, journey, and they didn't come in order. Like it was really? here, here, here. Oh wow! And so I was sitting there. Well, maybe if I put this one here and that one there and that, right, right. and that took a while, and they were all short little pieces. I literally made each one a separate file on the computer. Wow! And then I had, and then putting them together had to be a production and a half. Cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. Wow! Um, but yeah, it really was a process where you had to do it, and so just um, do it, and you have to enjoy it. You can't, yeah. you can't think of it as a job. Like when. There were three kids running around the house, and I was teaching and all. I would say, well, if I do this, I'm giving up doing that or this or this. And your wife is and glad it, that you waited. <laughs> 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 and, um, but now that I have the time, um, it really is one of the joys. We, we go away a lot, and we, the month of September, we spend down south, and we have a place right on a pond. And I take the laptop out, and I sit by the pond, and... And in fact, we, we go for the winters a lot of time. We go to Key West. And nice. a lot, every one of the three books begins and ends in Key West. You and Hemingway. <laughs> well, I went to Hemingway's house. I'm not Hemingway, but I saw his house. And all those six toed cats. And all those six toed yeah. cats. And there six -toed are a lot of them. <laughs> yes, there are. So all. you could channel some Hemingway into yes. this? Well, a lot of the, the scenes, to be realistic, you, you, you know, I would say, well, I remember this, I remember that. And you can be very descriptive when you've actually seen when the actually things seen you're it. putting into the... Well, that's what I love about actually going to the places. I don't know. I think I'm going to have to take a trip with you to the Holy Land if you want to research the book and really be there. <laughs> that would be helpful. That would be helpful, he says. <laughs> All right. So, so just do it. Plug ahead. And, and Key West is never a bad thing. Is that what no, you're saying? No, never. Okay. <laughs> never. Once never. you get past those first few 
paragraphs or pages, yes. then it becomes so much easier, I think. It's that, that's the hump. It's like just Get starting. past the hump just and starting. it just flows after that, I well, think. Yeah, it also gets easier when you, like, I had all these little pieces, but once I had a direction, like when I, when I started the third book, I kept saying, well, I know where I want to begin it and I know where I want to end it. But when all the little pieces started to fit in the middle, I said, oh, it isn't written yet, but I know exactly you know where it's exactly going. where it's going to go. I love that. Well, I hope that you've inspired some of our viewers. Um, all of our authors tonight, their books, their links to their websites, please support our authors, can be found at BetweenTheCoversTV.com. And I'm going to ask all of our authors to please send me any events, readings, and future books. And when book three comes out, I think Bill is going to have to join us back on the couch. Okay. Thanks for joining us at BetweenTheCoversTV.com, and have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>